Hello once again, Monster Hobbies Model Car Builders. Welcome back to another one of our group builds, uh, our build party. Sorry, the camera started and I forgot about this window thing here, so just bear with me. There's the door with the ugly ego box once again. So that means you've come to the right place. <laughs> All right. My name is Trevor Slescu, owner of Monster Hobbies in High River, Alberta, Canada. You can find us online at www.monster-hobbies.ca or phone the store at 403-652-5019. Our website is in Canadian dollars. We offer free shipping on Canadian orders over $75. We accept PayPal and credit cards on our secure pay system, which means that if you buy something online and you want to use your credit card, all that information is erased at the end of the transaction. If you use the coupon code YouTube at the checkout, you save 10% off your next purchase. And don't forget to sign up for the free newsletter. On our website over on this side, we uh, sent one out today. It was basically dealing with the graphic novels that we have for sale. So that would be, <coughs> pardon me. <coughs> oh my goodness. Graphic novels like um, uh, The Incredible Hulk and uh, Superman, Batman, all those kind of things. We, My daughter and I have been working on those together and uploading them onto our website. And there's quite a lot. I have many, many, many countless boxes of things that I'm trying to feverishly hammer on to monster-hobbies.ca. And it's insane. <laughs> So today I'm going to carry on with my Packard Fiaton build. This is, of course, the monogram kit. This one is a 1987 edition, and it is a very nice. The original edition came out in the 70s, and they were part of the Hera Auto Museum collection, which was quite a good one at the time. I see there's three people in the room so far, or three people watching. So what have you brought in today? I know uh, I w yesterday I couldn't do the um the build party because i was out with our scout group we actually had quite a bit of fun camp silverland out here and um it was quite an interesting thing i'll just briefly tell you about it so we arranged the three groups yeah no problem <laughs> anyway we arranged the three groups of kids and we sent them off, and they had a task. They had to start a, uh, they had to find a, or make a shelter. Then they had to, uh, it was a shelter that we could find them at. So it needed like reflectors and things like this on it, whatever. Then they had to make a campfire. This is all winter stuff. And, um, oh, there was supposed to be an injury, and they took care of the injury and all this stuff. So it was kind of nice because leaders, didn't need to be there because this was a kid challenge. So the leaders did our own challenge. Now, unfortunately, I think I I hurt my thumbs right in here because <laughs> the one scouter says, who needs experience lighting campfires? Oh, Trevor, you do. So here, here's the axes and the hatchets and go over to the wood pile and <laughs> use the swing axes to cut everything up, right? So... I haven't used an axe in that way <laughs> very often. <laughs> so, of course, hitting, you know, holding the axe and swinging it down, hitting the, the wood, I guess, caused the handle to move a little bit right in my thumb there. So they're all sore. So I don't know if, how much I can grab this stuff today. I'll have to see. So in the room now, we have Wayne Wat Watton. So yeah, and then we have Mike's Model Shop in Texas and Big Charlie. So it's so nice to see you all. Seven people today. Must be Sunday. All right. Okay, what can I say? Well, what did everybody bring today? Where did I leave off? Uh, <coughs> that's the other thing. It's been so dry, my poor lungs are... Just like drying out. But the weather has improved in Alberta, so maybe if everything goes right, I might be able to start painting some of this stuff. So what I did is I sanded underneath the fenders because there was a bunch of mold marks in here. 
there's a few in the back, and I was debating whether to fill them in with putty because it's so hard to get in here. And then I started to put the frame and all that in, and I noticed that the frame covers over top of the mold marks and down here. Ooh, Big Charlie is waiting for a big snowstorm in Ohio. We're actually starting to get into the positive numbers up here. It's supposed to be about plus six or plus nine Celsius. <coughs> so I don't know quite what that is in Fahrenheit right now. It's just nice and warmer. <laughs> so that's always good. Oh yeah, the tops of the fenders are still shiny. So I'm thinking of just sanding them down with maybe some 600 grade sandpaper. Just enough to get paint to bite into the little grooves in here. Overall, though, this is a nice kit. I have built it before, of course. I think a lot of you have seen that before, too. <laughs> well, i got to stand up to go get it, and I don't really want to do that. <laughs> anyway. So, as you may recall, last week I glued the engine block together. 31 degrees Fahrenheit here. So that is, I think, minus 35 Celsius, if I remember. Yeah, because I did that video about how cold it was early January. So there we go with our big Packard 358, I believe, cubic inch engine. Oh, 384 cubic inch. So every week I give a little story about my dad. <laughs> anyway. Yeah, it was a birthday just on the t uh, a while ago there. And, uh, well, he passed away a few years back. So, But he actually owned. Hey, there's number one. Hi, Trev and Danny. When is the big after holidays restock for model kit? Well, that's the fun part. <laughs> I've got to get a whole bunch of money to restock. Uh, anyway, so keep buying all my old stuff. I know you already have it. But buy it again anyway. <laughs> no, uh, yeah, we're I'm still in transition. I've only been like four months from not having the actual brick and mortar shop. So I am trying to make some sales. And December was really nice, but January is really uh, not happening for sales this month. Although people are still phoning, they're all still trying to find stuff out, but it's not much really going on. So I don't know. It's, it's a big uh, learning curve, really, to go from... <clears throat> from the internet or from a brick and mortar store where you got people always walking in to the internet where they won't find you unless you have the right keywords or whatever else. And I've been posting things on Facebook and on email. So I just sent out the newsletter and I've got Instagram going and I've got YouTube, of course, Every single time I say, my name's Trevor, and, you know, go through the the public service message or whatever, <laughs> you know. And uh, for whatever reason, it's just not quite happening this time. Maybe I should do another uh, here's what I have on hand video. I've been thinking about that. Another what's in stock live stream. So we'll see. But my main goal, I've been thinking about this. So we get income tax, of course, right? And that's every April up here in Canada. you got to submit all your tax information by the end of the month. So I have a ton of product that's like, well, like, for example, this stack of cards, you know. I've got uh, boxes and boxes, about 30 boxes of cards. Like these ones, you know, um, jet engines and or jet aircraft and there's like NASCAR ones and all, all this stuff but I must have about 65,000 cards right <laughs> I 
And then I've got <laughs> graphic novels. I got comic books like this Elvira one here from the movie. All this kind of stuff. So what I'm thinking is, <clears throat> usually over the past few years, we have gotten quite a lot of money back on our income taxes. And of course, I've been using that in the past to correct like slow months and whatever else from the store. But now that rent is not an issue, what I'm thinking of doing is actually <clears throat> setting a goal to try to get all this stuff that's back here and in other bedrooms and in my bathtub and all this other stuff, get it all on our website. Okay. And then from there, you know, so we've got, uh, we're almost into February. So February, March, April, right? It's three months. <clears throat> I'll get my tax papers all together and I'll be uploading all this other stuff to the website. I'm just going to try to write it out until April. Then when April hits, or, well, I guess May, because then, you know, when we get the income tax money back, I'm thinking of actually <clears throat> using that money to try to restock new stuff and to advertise. In the meantime, I'll still try to get some stuff in, but it wouldn't be huge, massive orders. So, again, it's almost like with the brick and mortar store shut down, it really feels like even after 17 years in business, it's like day one all over again from the get-go. You know, I might as well be in the, the flea market where we started off <coughs> as far as it goes, because everything I established in the brick and mortar is kind of gone, except for the product itself, which I still have. The product itself is not 100% online. So again, it's like a reboot, you know, like your computer when it, <laughs> when you shut the power off and start it all over again. That's what it feels like with, uh, with the uh, hobby shop right now. I'm not even going back to my default settings. I'm just somewhere in the middle of all of it. <laughs> so it'll be interesting. But yeah, I definitely need to uh, get advertising outside of the internet. Facebook and all that jazz because now this is something interesting. I've got these books. <clears throat> I got two books over Christmas, right? Online swap meet. Well, online swap meet is good. If I've got this, I want to get rid of it. Oh, you've got something I want. Let's just trade. But, you know, as far as, you know, <clears throat> getting money to, to get brand new inventory in. It's a little bit different, right? I need to actually take my stuff and sell it. <laughs> but yeah. Well, let's we'll see how it all goes. Hobby shops are like antique stores. You know, the more stuff that's there, the better. And sometimes if things are very old, it sells faster. But yeah. <laughs> The other thing I'm thinking of doing in the meantime is putting up flyers around town again, saying, hey, I'm here. Come get me. <laughs> as far as that goes. Oh, yeah, I was saying uh, I got these books. And um, at Christmas, one of them is a modern book on advertising. Could have other items that are just for sale. Yeah. Yeah, another way to do it is using uh, Google, or no, sorry. Uh, what is it? Oh, Facebook Marketplace. I had a bit of success out of there. And then, but that's kind of more local, right? And um, Instagram, use Instagram for a, a business thing. But yeah, anyway. So it's interesting. I've got an old book on advertising from the 60s. And then recently, I've got a book on how to advertise in today's world from a, <clears throat> a guy that started in the advertising business in 1979 and still going today. And then I got a book on um, YouTube, how to make your YouTube channel into a business channel. Now, I already have one, but 
again, it's kind of <clears throat> it's kind of um, not really going too well right now because <laughs> I need to focus on it a bit, right? But uh, anyway, what was interesting about it is both the new advertising book and the YouTube book says that uh, the best bet out there is to advertise on the radio. So how's that for 21st century advice? Eh? Advertise on the radio. But they find that um, out of all the, the media things, <clears throat> people listen to radio the most, which is like very interesting. Because, <laughs> you know, everybody, like, you always get a lot of people that seem to want to tell you what is dead and what is not dead and all this other stuff. And just to listen to some of this, just it wears you out. <laughs> it gets you down because I don't know how many people really, really understand that to, to advertise, you got to hit everything as long as you got, you know, enough money for it. But, uh, you know, you have somebody tell you, oh, yeah. So you, you go to the newspaper and you say, hey, I'm going to advertise on the radio. The newspaper people say, oh, nobody listens to the radio anymore. You want to advertise in our newspaper. So then you go over to the, the radio and you say, hey, the guys at the newspaper told me uh, that I should advertise. I don't know. You know, you go up to the radio and you say, I'd like to do a newspaper advertisement. And then the radio people tell you, no, no, don't do that. Print is dead. <laughs> so, so print is dead. How come I'm still getting the newspaper every week? <laughs> so, anyway. Ah, oh, man. I always found that humorous. What I should do is, well, I don't know. How about lunchtime sales video offers on YouTube? Catch some board at the office. The only sort of downside with that, number one, is that <clears throat> YouTube, it's, um, how do you put it? It may be lunchtime where you are, but it's going to be 2.30 where somebody else is and 5 o'clock where another person is and all the rest. So there's nothing really consistent as far as time goes on YouTube. So e even this, it's one o'clock my time. What time is it your time? Actually, it's it's one thirty, right? <laughs> so yeah, it's one of those deals where it's like it's not consi consistent enough that it's all going to hit everybody at noon. So really, what I need is commercials that to make my own commercials on YouTube that people can just tune in at any time, and that's what the uh, Monster Hobbies official YouTube channel is sort of about right now. But what I should be doing is making things about um, uh, group builds and events and things like that. But yeah. No, I just find it interesting that they say radio is a good one. And... Uh, Yeah, that's the other thing. So that's what I'm thinking anyway. When April comes around, or March comes around, May comes around, whatever month comes around, after income tax, I should be able to to have enough to do a good advertisement. So the other thing is there's sort of like a, a go live or setting up a store or something, let's say, right? So your go live date is the date when you decide, okay, no more setting up the store. We will uh, now open the store. So to go live, that would be like turning on the website, um, you know, uh, having the opening day ceremony thing or whatever else and having a radio ad or a TV ad or a combination of those ads to all fire off. So let's say your your go live day is going to be April the 1st. Then you want all that stuff to fire off on April the 1st so that 
or by April the 1st or knowing that people are, you're going to start at April the 1st or whatever else so that everybody can catch in and go to your store on that day. So that's what I need, but a digital version saying, okay, now that the store is all there, you can easily log on and you're just going to find everything or whatever, right? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> everything I have to offer. So, <sighs> so number one is saying maybe buy an old collection of kits and other items and offer them at used kit prices. Or I can buy a bunch of old kits and sell them at current collector prices. Or I could even sell them at regular prices of new kits as long as they're not open or whatever. Yeah. Okay, so anyway. Okay, so we're going to carry on with the Packard engine block. And now I'm just going to clip off the cylinder head cover. Now, back in these days, these motors were uh, L head. So that means that. If you can see that, this is the row of spark plugs up the middle. And then there's sort of a, a gap space in here where nothing's there, except for the head bolts, of course, right? So what's happening is the valves are pointing upside down like this, and the cylinder is right beside it. So it's like this. So the camshaft is down below in the engine somewhere in here. probably down there. <laughs> so anyway, uh, so what happens, oh, I guess it would be along this thing, potentially. What happens is the, the lobes of the um, camshaft are down there, and the valves are sitting on top of the camshaft like this. So as the piston goes up, one of them, of course, opens, lets the air-fuel mixture in, and then as the piston goes down, it changes to the exhaust you know, to get ready for all that. So all this is happening upside down. So they called it an L-head design. And uh, that's what most of these vintage era cars used. So I'm just going to get rid of the little cutoff points. And I'm kind of hoping that... Uh, our Walmart start bringing back model cars. Cause I noticed on a lot of those Facebook um, groups and whatnot, every now and again, someone's posting, Hey, look what Walmart got a big end display with all these model cars on it. And then of course, everybody says, well, they don't have that in Toledo, Ohio, and they don't have that in New Haven, Connecticut or whatever. Right. And so we don't get that in Canada up here, but, it's hard to know if Walmart is still carrying model cars. Maybe we'll get an end display. But, I mean, if we get an end display at Walmart, you know, if it was like the cars in the past, their prices are quite lower. So that's another opportunity for me to get some of those for the stock in the store. But... Uh, I don't know. I don't know if we'll see them up here. It's hard to say. So again, fun stuff. But uh, I mean, there's there's things I want to bring in that I can get from my wholesalers. I just need to increase my cash flow a bit. <laughs> but uh, one of them is the Ravel double decker British bus. How many of you have built that one? Or seen that one so that bus is uh well a big double decker kit and it's really cool <clears throat> so anyway so these packard motors my dad was telling me that um, he had a he had a 1948 packard unfortunately i didn't get to inherit that he ended up selling it uh 
to a guy down in the States that uh, apparently had enough money to restore the thing. <laughs> but his Packard was the year before the automatic. So maybe it was a 47 or 48. And uh, it had a hydraulically assisted clutch. When you came up to the light, the clutch pedal sucked in and went down. So uh, then you'd shift gears. And then when you put your foot on the gas, the clutch pedal would come back up hydraulically. And then the following year, they, they made a proper automatic for it. So that was uh, quite a thing. Okay. Uh, but anyway, my dad was saying that the Packard Motors, I'm just trying to find the pieces. Okay, so there's the front timing chain cover. And I moved some of these braces. <laughs> so he was saying that the Packard engines were designed in the 20s. And what Packard did that made the other car made it that Rolls Royce of America thing was like as you know, all these engine blocks are made out of cast iron, right? So what happened is when you heat up cast iron, it's nice and red and hot inside. And then as the metal cools down, it shifts and warps just a little bit. So none of the iron blocks are, um, how can I put it? They're all rough castings and they're all kind of moved and whatever. So what Ford and GM and everybody else would do is they pull their engine out of the casting sands or whatever, the mold. And then they would drill all the pilot holes in for the pistons and the, the uh, valves and everything else. And then let that cool for maybe a week and then come back and drill in the corrected holes and everything like that and allow the engine to sort of get the flex and everything out of it from being cast. Well, the problem is they're, you're still, it's still hot in the block or whatever. So what Packard would do is they would, <laughs> they would take the blocks out and let them cool for about a year, then drill the pilot holes in, let that cool for five years, and then drill in the final holes and put the engine together and send it out. So your Packard engine never had all this wear built into it from twisting and cooling down. So that was the uh, the Packard way. So his his Ford Packard, I think, also has this 348 cubic inch engine in it. And there wasn't too much uh, modification and things like that out of those Packard blocks, the straight eights. But yeah, they were so reliable. My dad tells me that my grandpa had a 37 Packard or something. And uh, my grandpa ran it on original parts so much that the distributor actually wore out inside at an angle. <laughs> so the rotor was going around and kind of up, you know. And uh, it would hit the, the four spark plugs, and then it would be up on the other four spark plugs. So the thing ran rough until my dad and my uncle went and put a whole new distributor in it. And then it ended up being fine. And my grandpa didn't like that because he, um, <laughs> he didn't like all the extra power in the car afterwards. <laughs> just like just the original other four cylinders operate. <laughs> ah, man, people in the past had their own rules, I guess. <laughs> Uh, my grandpa was a, a house builder, and uh, he didn't like the, okay, you're going to love this. He didn't like the, uh, he got a new 52 Cadillac, I think it was, and he had Packard before it, right? So he didn't like the, <laughs> he didn't like the Cadillac. He thought it was a big piece of junk because as a house builder in that with the Packard, now there was no. Now we're, we're not talking roof racks when I tell you this. So with no roof racks, my grandpa used to take all the lumber and throw it on the roof of the Packard. And the Packard roof 
it's you know really solid and everything so it was fine so when my my grandpa got this 52 cadillac he did the same thing took all the plow or the wood threw it on the roof of this cadillac and the roof dented inward what a piece of junk the roof dented <laughs> ah man <laughs> anyway Yeah, I guess no comprehension that uh, you shouldn't throw stuff on the roof. But again, you know, I guess that the old hard as nails generation, I guess, expected everything to be as hard as nails. <laughs> so I should ask number one, like, which new models are you looking for? because I can narrow down the search, if you're still watching. I know some of the new ones I'd like to get is uh, like the AMT Oldsmobile kits that came out. I'm a big uh, Oldsmobile guy. I used to belong in the Oldsmobile Club in uh, North Vancouver, BC, or Vancouver, BC, I guess, when I was young. Still got my club jacket from those days. Still got my car from those days. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, they, uh, the Oldsmobile Club. So I'm trying to get all the Oldsmobile model cars that I can. And as you know, there aren't very many. So the two new ones from AMT add into the, uh, the niceness of having the subject matter. Yeah. So how's everybody's builds? Where are you at so far? You getting anything done? Getting anything finished for 2022? Yeah. Always nice when you get things finished. Doesn't matter what year it is. <laughs> Finish your vegetables. <laughs> Ah, boy. What else can I do? I'm kind of doing this all sporadically here. It's not really uh, choosing anything in particular. <sighs> well, wait. You see? Oh, there's the oil pan for the motor. Did I start to clean this one up? doesn't look like it yeah it doesn't look like it so it's kind of nice some of the uh, people that played Warhammer see that was another thing I was doing at the store was Warhammer and uh, we had the tables all set up and everything so a lot of people were able to come down and play and I'd also run tournaments right now I would be doing a January tournament if I still had the building Sadly, I don't. What I re really should do is, for Warhammer, some of the uh, Warhammer groups will do a, a challenge, right? Because Warhammer is an army-based game, so the kids buy little figures. And it's all, uh, we play Warhammer Fantasy, so it's all, um, actually, it's called Age of Sigmar now. It's sort of the... Uh, modern what became a fantasy for warhammer so what these challenges do is they say okay um no oh, because you're building all these little armies you've got units of uh of 10 figures you know, so basically they have it as a, a core uh special you know that sort of thing so the core soldiers are just like your warriors armed with sh swords and shields and that sort of thing. And then you've got elites that are the, the better trained army units and this sort of thing. So what these challenges do is they say, okay, uh, this month, let's challenge everybody to get a box of 10 of the figures. Um, let's do core unit warriors or something. So whatever warriors you have in your army. And we will get a new box, open up the box, and 
everybody paint their army. And then when you're done, paint the 10 models when you're done, send pictures to wherever. And then we'll all put all those pictures of everything you built on our page. And you guys can feel proud that you got this thing done. And then next month, we'll do one of the bigger monsters, like the dragon or something like that. And everybody go get a dragon and paint the thing. And, you know, that's that's how that Warhammer thing works. So really, what I should do is do those kind of challenges. There we go. As you can see, the oil pan fits on there quite nicely. That Packard big motor. Lots of good stuff. This is really good kit, and it came out 1975. Still goes together well today. Of course, this model's from 87. <laughs> so that's not too far from, uh, you know, the mold thing. Now, I was thinking of actually gluing these parts on, but the only uh, thing about it... So my instruction sheet is saying that the oil pan, the front timing cover, are aluminum, but the block is green. Now, is that cylinder head cover is green. So I can only glue a few things on here right now because the other parts are aluminum or aluminum. Or maybe they're even LU maximum. <laughs> you know, it's funny. Uh, in Canada, and I do believe in the US, we say aluminum as like aluminum, one word. But in Britain, in England, in Australia, they would say aluminum. It's spelt the same. But um, for every minimum, there has to be a maximum, right? So is there an LU maximum to your LU minimum? <laughs> I don't know. Crazy thoughts again. Crazy thoughts from crazy minds. <laughs> oh, here's Steve. How much of a challenge would would be to do an online challenge of sorts with your fans, not competitive just for fun? Well, that would be a group build, wouldn't it? Maybe a group, a, a competitive group build? I guess so. Actually, you know, maybe we're on to something here in a way. So um, what about uh, every model car has an engine block. Every model car has a body. Every model car has suspension. What if it was something like that? This week's challenge is to finish your engine block. Next week's challenge, well, I don't know, because some of them are, <laughs> some of them are, some of the model cars, like, what if you got a curbside or something? But um, I don't know. I guess we could figure something out. Yeah, that Warhammer thing kind of lends itself to that, though. But uh, our universe is a little bit different with model cars. And it seems like it's like everybody is building one big thing or, you know, showing their steps somewhere. But it'd be kind of nice if we could all do one model together. But again, that leaves people out. Because if they don't have or don't want that model, there you go, right? If if it's not everyone's trip to build the uh, AMT 1950 Ford, which is a great kit, the convertible with all the custom features, then, uh, uh, you know, three people are into it. Oh, actually, after this video, if you go on to the uh, community tab, you can see that I've been working on a... Um, what do you call it? A poll as to what people want to build for a group build for our channel here. So I, I listed a bunch of things, and it sort of seems like everybody wants to do hot rod custom and show car for builds. 
because I had uh, classic cars, I had um, sports cars. So that would have been like the Corvettes and the Ferraris and Aston Martins and all that stuff. And then what were the other two? Na uh, NASCAR and racing, which would also have included drag racing and whatnot. And, um, oh, classic cars from 1930 to 1940. So it seems like everybody really wanted to do the hot rods, dragsters, and uh show rods so show rods would be like the ed big daddy roth uh mysterion and those kind of things and then uh, hot rods would be like your model a that was uh has a chrysler hemi in there or something like that and then custom cars would sort of be like the 50s lead sleds and that sort of theory so like 60s 70s low riders uh you know big big boats with big wheels and <laughs> lots of uh body filler and custom parts so everybody seems to want that so i'm not too sure if i should split the category again because now that i've weeded it down to people want to do hot rods customs and show rods do i split that into a new poll it says how many people are on board with just doing customs only just doing hot rods only or just doing show cars only. And then hopefully there's no like gray area between what's a show car and what's a show rod <laughs> or, uh, you know, that kind of thing, a hot rod and a show rod. <laughs> so, or a rat rod, or do I just leave it as just the three and whatever we get is what we get. So again, it's, it's more research and sorting out. No, there's not a lot of parts to this Packard. Oh, there's all the intakes and exhaust manifolds. Let's see. Now, that's interesting. They show the block here. And if, if you're in uh, Quebec, this could be the block Quebecois. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> oh, okay, there it is. So there's all the intake stuff there on the second panel uh, oh one thing about this this is an updraft carburetor so our modern carburetors well no modern carburetor but you know carburetors from the six, 60s 70s or 50s 60s 70s and 80s are uh, downdraft carburetors so what that means is the engine manifold is up top on the v8 and the carburetor is up top. Actually, downdraft is is older than that, but still. So uh, the air fuel mixture comes in the top through the air cleaner, gets sucked down into the engine via the carburetor, but it's going in a downward motion into the tops of the cylinder heads. In this era, the early early days, even the Model Ts are like this. You've got an updraft carburetor. So it's sitting on the bottom of the car and it's sucking the air fuel mixture upward into the cylinder heads via the intake manifold. So they're a different sort of beast, <laughs> but still not too hard to figure out. You just need the reference photos from the web. So I'm getting a lot of people that like my group build idea. But yeah, I think I should uh, maybe make a new video saying, okay, the group build is going to be... The only thing is I don't get much time to build. So I don't know how it's going to work for me. <laughs> Got a lot of things on the go. <laughs> Maybe I just get Danny the dog to build it for me. <laughs> oh, man. Can't take credit where from somebody else's model, even if it's Danny's. <laughs> Each month should have a theme build contest. Um, maybe, but I don't know. Um, well, give me an example, because I don't do a lot of group 
I work at home, so technically building a model during the day is work, as well as all the other work, like submitting the things online, making sure I've got YouTube videos for Friday, uh, as well as running the live streams on Wednesdays and the group build party on Saturday, picking up my kids from school, <laughs> and everything else. But yes, I do technically work from home. But it's not this free, open adventure like you might think it is. <laughs> it takes a while to uh, edit videos and edit websites and keyword things in and on and on. IPMS Club had themes like delivery vehicles for December. Yeah, could be good, but how many people actually got all that stuff finished within a month? Or would it be more like two months, do them six, six in a year, as opposed to 12 in a year? Two seaters for February. <laughs> oh boy. Do you know the story as to why the Model T's are so narrow? <laughs> Henry Ford was a sort of a Puritan, had Puritan Christian beliefs. <laughs> List all the themes in December meeting for the next year so people can choose what to. Oh, okay. Yeah, that would work then. Yeah, I think if I was springing this on everybody every month, they'd be uh, not so into it. But if it's all done ahead of time, then that's makes it easier. Thanks for the tip, number one. But yeah, um, Henry Ford had some Puritan thoughts on uh, his car, and he didn't want anybody having hanky-panky in his cars. So he... Specifically, purp purposely, I guess, made all his cars narrow enough that no one could actually lie down across the seat long ways. <laughs> so the two seater and two seats in February just got me reminded of that. <laughs> no hanky panky in a Model T or a Model A. Or anything prior to 1948. <laughs> I don't know. Ooh, now I'm all embarrassed getting in, into a risque conversation. <laughs> Any builder could be involved like military guys and plane guys that can find a kit to fit the themes. True. Well, you know, every September in the old store, I used to have a model car contest. And I tried to do it at the same time as the, we have a car show that comes in town. And I tried to make the contest on the same day that the car show was, which worked out in our old location because we had a downtown location. But then right after the High River flood, we moved to a location in the industrial park area that was upstairs. And when the car show came into town, everybody took their cars, parked it down where our store was, and then went over to the car show, not realizing that my store was open and that they could come in and uh, shop and look at the model car contest and all the rest. So after a year or two of that, I just shut it down because there was no point. <laughs> and nobody missed it, unfortunately. But, you know, I'll tell you, I, I do want to get back into a, a brick and mortar store eventually. This time around, I'm going to make it the right way that it was supposed to be intended, which is on ground level, 
where everybody can access the front door and get in and out, where I've got an area for a display window that I can constantly change the themes up in the window every month. And um, what else? Have room for gaming tables and the whole deal. Yeah, it should be good. Hmm. Yeah, monthly contest theme. Book ahead. I can always just write it into my, um, figure out what I'm doing and then write it into the uh, uh, <coughs> the news <coughs> the news section on my model page. So yeah, thanks for that idea. Actually, I just need to find the um, the old old model car or not car <clears throat> sorry i got some in my throat it's eating walnut oh here's a weird walnut question for anyone and everyone i found a walnut today normally you know how they've there's sort of like the shells are like a, a clam shell thing and they're they've got like a split in the middle right and then you take your nutcracker and you crack them on that that little split area and it splits the nut I found one that had three, like an airplane propeller. So one one of those seams came down, and then two branched off like that. Has anyone found a walnut like that? <laughs> if so, let me know, because I might have just eaten like the world's first tri-bladed walnut. <laughs> I destroyed a historical artifact for my lunch. I don't know. <laughs> so anyway, let me uh, let me know if you ever found something weird like that. But, um, yeah, interesting. Never saw a walnut like that before. Oh, yeah, one other thing about these Packards from 1930 is, that, you know, normally, like, underneath a car, all the frame rails and everything are painted gloss black or semi-gloss black or something. Packard painted all their undercarriage parts to match whatever the fenders were. So with this one, see how it's like the maroon red color? Then these match, and then you put this underneath. So in your Packard frame, you don't have this funny difference of colors underneath there and everything. So everything is painted to match whatever the fenders are. So your differential is also painted like an you know, red, maroon color, uh, all that sort of thing. So just keep that in mind when you're building your model. If you got black fenders, chances are your frame is black. If you got green ones, then it's green. Yeah, that kind of thing. Yeah, find 10 of the same kits and get 10 people to sign up. Um... Oh, why are you retracting all your messages? <laughs> Don't retract your messages, number one. Uh, find 10 of the same kits and get 10 people to sign up for the contest and send them the kits. Yeah, but they'd have to pay for the kits. <laughs> anyway, I'm not quite in that position just to be like, hey, free stuff, everyone. But yeah. Yeah, you're deleting all your stuff. Don't do that. Why? <laughs> Why retract? Yeah, that Rocky Mountain Model Car Club thing had categories. So it was a category sheet, and it said uh, what the categories for their contest are. So yeah, I could use that as a reference point for um, 
for like number one says to do those group build once a month projects. So what did everybody bring into the group to build with today? What, do you, what projects are you working on? Or are you working on any projects or just watching me build this Packard? <laughs> Let me know. Anyway. Exciting. Okay. Anyway, uh, so what can be said? I know what can be said. My name is Trevor Slescu. I'm the owner of Monster Hobbies in High River, well, online. So this should say online. We are located at www.monster-hobbies.ca. Our phone number is 403-652-5019. And uh, Steve Copsey here is saying that I'm working on the 59 Chevy Bel Air from AMT. Is that the new one or the old one? Because there's actually two of them. Um, the new one has the opening hood, or pardon me, the opening trunk on the back. And the new one, the old one doesn't. The old one doesn't have the um, Bel Air fins molded in smooth so you can build the 210 oh the new one it's a nice one <laughs> i've got two of those one in stock and one in custom and i unbox them on this channel as well so anyway getting back to this monster hobbies thing our site is priced in canadian dollars we offer free shipping on canadian orders over 75 dollars we also accept PayPal and credit cards on our secure pay system on our website. So once you have bought something, you enter in your credit card information. When the order is processed, the credit card information is destroyed forever. No one can access it. We have a very, very good uh, security system on our website. And if you use the coupon code YouTube in lowercase letters at the checkout, you will save 10% off your next purchase. Don't forget to sign up for our newsletter off the side. I've just sent out a new one. This, this uh, newsletter that I sent out this time around is all about the new graphic novels and comic books that we've uploaded onto our website, www.monster-hobbies.ca. We also have a ton of model car books and other reference info that's out there. And yeah. <laughs> His paint namer is saying that he has had a big life change and has not glued or painted anything since mid-December, but it will get better in just reorganizing for now and loving it. Oh, that's good. It's almost like where I am. At. I'm at reorganizing everything, getting it all ready for website. <laughs> I'm hoping this thing, this plan of mine, will... Uh... Now I'm going to make this plan of mine explode in may and get the this year going really well for the store there's no maybe no thinking about it just do it <laughs> but yeah yeah we're talking about uh, group builds and contest ideas and everything else so uh, i put out there on the community tab 
a uh, poll, an online poll as to who would like to build what for a group build. And I found some rules on how to run like a group build from one of the websites that does a lot of group builds throughout the year. So I can just adapt those sort of rules, as it were, to uh, to what we're doing for our group build. And it seems to be that the choice that kind of won out on ours is hot rods, show rods, and custom cars, which could be fun. <laughs> so it would be uh, sort of everybody build something and then we can all share the, the pictures on Facebook and do a YouTube video sort of series on our own channels. They just use a hashtag, which I come up with. So what happens is when you, uh, I don't know how many of you know this, when you make a YouTube video in the description box, you put in a hashtag. So that's the pound key. So num you'd hold down shift and hit number three to get the uh, this that and then put in whatever thing it is as one word in lowercase so hashtag that's a hashtag monster hobbies so if you look at my videos you'll see that that's always there if you click on that hashtag because it turns blue so what happens is you put it in your description box, a hashtag, and it'll come up right underneath the window on the video. And there'll be like some words down there. And they're all in blue. So you click on that. And what that does is YouTube creates a page with all the videos that share that hashtag on there. So I have a hashtag AMT model cars. So if you click on that hashtag, it'll take you to all the unboxing videos, everything that I've done that's an AMT model kit. Same will happen for Monogram, for Ravel, whatever the hashtag is. It'll take you to a page with all those videos. So if we do a group build, I'll come up with some fancy hashtag for that, like Monster Hobbies group build. That's simple, you know. Should be more dy dynamic, like the group build that ate my garage. I don't know, whatever. Anyway, you click on that hashtag and every image will come up. So if you're making videos for this, you click on your hashtag, it'll come up with yours, mine. Yeah, uh, let's see who's here. Steve's, Paint Namer, Number One's, Mike's Model Shop. They'll all be on that page so we can all look at who's building what and how far they are in, what kind of fun they're having there, and what uh, experience they can bring to the, the build, all that kind of stuff. So it, the hashtags are quite useful that way and a lot of fun. I, I'm not sure if they work quite the same way on Facebook. I do believe so. Actually, they do. They take you to a page, but it's not like little video um, thumbnails. It's more like a long list you got to scroll down. But still, lots of fun. So, yeah. Everybody uh, still working on something, still having fun out there. That's good. What else do we got? I'm a little leery on taking all these tiny parts off this Packard and cleaning them up because <laughs> kind of thinking that um, I might lose them. <laughs> I don't have a plastic bag sitting here to throw them into, or do I? <clears throat> no, I don't think I do. Well, there's the fan belt. One fan belt and a pulley. There we go. So I just take the file and kind of round it, make sure I'm not doing something I shouldn't be doing. Yeah, you want to make sure you're not making this flat across the bottom.
Yeah, there we go. Getting it done. I see somebody wrote something. Hang on. <laughs> Obviously pay for the kits. Yes. Always good. <laughs> Using my powers of concentration right now to make sure I get the seam line off this fan belt and pulley. thumb there <laughs> I'm swinging that axe yesterday <sighs> yeah it was interesting uh, I got my wife gave me this book for Christmas <laughs> and it's called the millionaire mindset pretty cool book talks about uh, some of the sort of the mindset you need to be to, I don't know, I guess be a millionaire, right? Obviously, otherwise they'd title, it, title the book something else. But <laughs> anyway, um, radio stations or TV stations? Yeah, interesting idea. Um, Anyway, this millionaire mindset, since we're talking about the uh, cars from the, this Packard here from the 30s, it's interesting. He says in there that, um, you know, they're talking about like what we learned about money and our attitude toward money was brought up when we were kids, right? Anyway, it was saying in there that uh, the people that lived through the 30s in the Great Depression we always think of, uh, like, my grandparents came from that era. And my parents, they were the kids of, of course, my grandparents that went through that era. And, you know, the Great Depression thinking was that because money was scarce in the Great Depression, everybody had to save it and this sort of thing. That's sort of, and, and really budget and all the rest. And that was sort of my grandparents' thinking. But this book was saying, there's actually two thoughts back in the Great Depression. One was the one we all know to save your money and pinch every penny and all this sort of thing and budget the heck out of your life. The second one was spend everything you could make. Can you believe that? In the Depression, people were thinking that. I guess the their thinking on that was uh, spend today for tomorrow we will starve or something. I don't know, you know? Live, live in the now for tomorrow we'll all pass or something like that. So that was interesting. I didn't think people thought that way in the Great Depression because my grandparents were always about, you know, save every dime and look for the best deal and the whole thing. So that I found that a bit interesting. And I'm only bringing that up because this is a 1930 Packard. So that, that was sort of the other thing about this too, is you would think, for the Great Depression, when nobody had money, because the stock market crash was 1929, why would anybody buy a car like this, the most luxuriant thing in the uh, in all of automotive history in that time period? Well, there was one video I watched where they were saying that nobody expected the stock market to crash in 1930, or 29, pardon me. So 
everybody was still living life as normal, right? For their time period. And uh, Packard had just made a whole bunch of big expensive cars for the 1930 model year and 31, because usually these car companies are a few years in advance, right? So they had just planned everything around, it's still 1928, times are good. Um, we're a car company that builds luxuriant monster cars for, you know, rich people and Hollywood movie actors and actresses and politicians and that sort of thing. So we'll just, you know, the 1930 model year is coming. So everything's just the same as, as it ever was. So we need to build all these big cars with chrome and fancy accessories and details and everything else. And then toward the end there, the stock market just bottomed out. So that's why you have cars up to 1933 that are still big and monstrous and luxuriant and all the rest is because nobody saw the stock market crash coming and they just built cars that were, um, you know, what they were building all the, the whole time. Oh, so here's my, uh, no, I hope this doesn't go flying. <laughs> here's my uh, clothes peg clips, clamps. So what I've done is you take a normal clothes peg and you push the spring out of it, take the wooden parts out, and you reverse it. This, this would be the left-hand side, for example, and this is the right, but now with reversing it, this is the right and that's the left, and it gives you this pointed end. So you don't have to cut these things at funny angles. You just reverse the spring in them. My dad taught me this one. And of course, I, this got gold paint on it. But they make nice clamps to hold on to. You can spray paint with these. Anything your heart desires. So I've just clipped out the back for our radiator. There's four mold marks back here, but I do believe they end up... Oh, there's a glass. Huh, missing a window. Uh-oh. I wonder where that went. Oh, I see it. <laughs> so here's our chrome for our Packard. Whew, nice. So there's our radiator. And this is the stone shield that they had. It was an option back in the day. The idea of the stone shield, of course, is so that um, stones don't punch through the slats on these radiators. And I do believe there was a, a control on here that opened up these slats, like a mechanical lever or lever. <laughs> lever, lever. And then, yeah, you can see the sunken in in the back. And there are three holes in here. Yeah, three holes. So one and two, three. And if you want the stone shield in there, you would drill them out from the back. Well, here's another thing you'll notice. There's a hole in the stone shield, and there's a little sort of a plug there. In... Uh, in the 30s, all the way up to about 1932 or 33, the cars, a lot of them had electric starter motors. Oh, OG is here. Hello. <laughs> Hello, OG. How are you doing? Anyway, um, the cars started to have electric starter motors by the late 20s, but they were still sort of a new thing. So a lot of the car companies left that hole in there and the little cap on so that if the electric starter failed, they included a crank with the car and you could just open up the little plug on there. And if your electric starter had failed, you were still able to hand crank the car. Can you imagine trying to hand crank a straight eight? That must have been quite the thing. <laughs> well, I guess you get your chauffeur to hand crank it. <laughs> Why would you do it? <laughs> if you can afford a Packard, you can afford a chauffeur to hand crank your Packard. Actually, if you read about um, some of the wealthy people at, in these time periods, 
I forget who it was, but one of them enjoyed driving so much that uh, even though he, ha he had a chauffeur, the chauffeur sat in the passenger compartment and the, the owner of the car actually drove the car around while the chauffeur was sitting in the back. And uh, yeah, he, he would just, you know, you have the chauffeur for the fact of paying somebody and giving them a job. But really, the chauffeur never had anything to do with this guy's car at all. <laughs> I forget who that was. Maybe J.P. Morgan or one of those guys. I don't know. But uh, funny, his funny history on how some people are. But I mean, if you enjoy driving, you know, it doesn't matter who you are, right? Rich or common, I guess you can drive your car. Choose to drive your car. So, oh, gee, what did you bring today to work on? Anything new or just trying to finish up something old or found something in a box from 35 years ago and figured now it's time to finish it? <clears throat> sort of my dilemma. <laughs> I've got a lot of things that are waiting for me. <laughs> They're waiting for me to get the uh, correct extra bottle of paint so I can finish them. And some of those guys have been waiting about 35 years for me to, to get a bottle of, you know, flat black or chrome silver or something like that, just to finish painting a distributor. <laughs> and I haven't quite got that paint color, or I got the paint color and forgot that they were there. The model was there waiting, waiting in the wings. Fun stuff. Oh, sickness. That's not good. Hopefully it's not the big C. COVID. <laughs> Hopefully it's something not so bad. Since this whole isolation thing, I have not had a cold in over two years. So I guess that's a plus. <laughs> it's funny they still sell all the cold remedy stuff at the store. I don't know if anybody is even using it. Anybody check into that? Is Dristan still a thing in 2020? Is there a market for Dristan in 2020? <laughs> Dyn Dynatap and those ones. Ny NyQuil. Are those guys kind of just sitting in the wings, hoping that it uh, they can sell that stuff again? Or what's the deal? <laughs> what's the deal? Do a Jerry Seinfeld moment here. Monologue. What's the deal with Dynatap? Oh, I got to scratch my uh, Packard windshield. I don't know if you can see that. Oops. So it's too bad that uh, Peter's not on here right now because I actually found an interesting thing. We were talking about making real authentic hinges for um, the Fords and whatnot, where they're like the fence post hinge, you know. And when we were at camp, our camp has this big gate across it so that um, nobody can, you know, drive in there and muck it up, you know, when, when uh, scouts aren't there. So I was looking at that gate and I noticed something that might be helpful for making hinges for Model A's and whatnot, Model T's. Our hinge doesn't have like, you know, the, the, the two pieces with the pin sitting in there that opens up. Our gate hinge has a metal, um, I don't know, like a post, I guess, like a nail, like a screw, whatever you want to call it. Comes out and then bends up at a 90 degree, degree angle and has a pin on the top. 
And then the other part of the hinge, which is the flat plate with the barrel, sits on this bent U pin or L shaped pin, pardon me. So I'm thinking maybe that might be a way to do some of those those uh, old hinges is have the the loop, the L shape coming from the bottom goes up and then the other piece falls on top of that you know the pin with the, the hole and uh, hooks up that way and it might be a lot easier than trying to make a top and a bottom but I don't know all this stuff is theory I have yet to actually build one of those hinges but yeah you take your aluminum or aluminum <laughs> can and uh cut little pieces out with your scissors and peter brought up a good point don't try to make the uh or how was it take the um take your wire and bend the aluminum around the wire don't try to drill a hole for a wire to go through just form it into shape so hopefully they'll be better and i noticed i was thinking of hinging the doors open on the board here And I noticed something about the Packard. See how there's no hinge thing sticking out, you know, like on a Model T. The Packard actually has the hinges hiding in behind the door. Oops. Between the door and the interior, just like a modern car does, where there's a post and they're mounted inside on the post, so you don't see the hinge sticking out through the, the car side. The only thing is the Packer door is very, very narrow. <laughs> so to make that hinge inside there again, it's the same kind of hinge. It's just hidden. You don't see it. So again, that would be something to work out out of there. But Peter, my good friend from England, actually has some really good ideas on that. Because he seems to make everything open up. Ooh. Kate, when you're scraping the seam lines on these Packard fan blades, be very careful because I just really bent that one. I think I didn't snap it off. I would hate to do that. Okay, which way was I going? Yeah, I've got this uh, car mag model car magazine. Or maybe it's a car magazine with the model car element in it from 1963. <laughs> and it's uh, George Barris and um, Ed Big Daddy Roth and a couple of others. And it's, it's all of them together in an interview on how to run a model car contest. <laughs> so, yeah. That was kind of neat. And then I, I used to have a whole bunch of car modeler magazines, but they got lost in the High River Flood, which is quite unfortunate because I used to go out and buy them from a hobby shop. I would leave uh, my house and I would take the bus down to the sea bus station in North Vancouver. Then I go across on the sea bus station and I take the sky train all the way out to New Westminster. And New Westminster had a hobby shop that was three floors. Well, sort of three floors, because there was a subfloor section. <laughs> oh, no, I know what it was. Yeah, it was three floors. So you came in on ground level, and you went up a little flight of stairs. And that was where all the uh, craft stuff was. For the ladies. <laughs> and then um, on the main level was uh, model boats and the Star Trek models. And no, wait a minute. Let me think about this. It's been forever since I've been there. And hopefully it's still around. But uh, they would have the, um... yeah, I guess the model cars were there on that level. And 
Oh, yeah, yeah. It's model cars, model airplanes, hobby supplies, and the magazines, and uh, whatever else was on that floor. And then when you went downstairs, they had the big battleships, the 1350 scale. So like the Enterprise aircraft carrier thing, the um, what it, whatever else was down there. And they'd have motorcycles down there. They'd have all the Star Trek models down there, so the big Enterprise. And, well, the 1537 scale and the 1650th original Enterprise models and the Klingon ship, all that stuff were, were uh, downstairs. And that was the hobby shop. And then in the basement, they even had a little subfloor level, but that's where they kept all the uh, the storage, you know. <laughs> yeah, that was pretty good. Oh, somebody needs a timeout already. Dang, I thought that was uh, 1964 BC on there. Actually, that would be the guy to ask. See if the uh, new Westminster Hobby Shop is still there. Now, across the street from there, they had a big comic book store. And a, a bridal shop. <laughs> so that was a, a fun place to be. But yeah. Yeah, that was um, my old hobby shop experiences growing up through the, the 80s, the 70s and the 80s. But of course, I wasn't going to the hobby shop in the 70s because I was a little too young. <laughs> but definitely through the 80s. Used to go to the three-floor hobby shop in New Westminster. And uh, yeah, I, <laughs> I remember one of the guys that worked there. Of course, being a kid, you don't really understand the humor of this stuff. You just think adults are being mean to you. <laughs> but at any rate, uh, the one guy, because they, they had the downstairs part, they had this little chain rope that went on. There was like the main floor and then in the corner, just behind the till, Oh, yeah, the RC stuff was up behind the guy, too. So anyway, they had this little door, and it had an open staircase that went down and then turned and came down to the basement. And they had this little chain across there. And, you know, I always ask, can I go downstairs? And the guy would say, I don't know, can you go downstairs? You know, to be funny, right? Like, oh, can you physically move your legs down the stairs? You know. He'd always say that. And of course, being a kid, you don't understand that's a joke. He's being funny. So, you know, I, I never liked that guy. <laughs> I just never liked that guy because he'd always say that, you know. Can you go down the stairs? You're like, oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so that's my first experience of not liking a hobby store employee. <laughs> Hopefully you guys don't have something similar. But, you know, now you look back on it. Now you're an adult and you run a, ran a hobby shop. And you kind of do understand that joke that he was joking. But at the time, it's like, uh, do I have to go there to experience this guy every single time with that same stupid, can you go down the stairs? Like, <laughs> Anyway, <laughs> so I never tried to, to say any of that kind of stuff when I owned my hobby shop. <laughs> do not doubt the abilities of your customers. I don't know. Anyway, so here's all our little cross braces that go into the frame. So I will cut that out. And you got to be careful with this one because that's a loop, that part where the drive shaft goes through the loop. But yeah, I mean, I'm not going to knock that hobby shop. I had tons of childhood uh, fond memories of it. And the other one was, uh, I think it was Woodward's in Canada, or Wolco. No, I think it was, it must have been Woodward's downtown. But I remember uh, it was a department store. And downtown, of course, all the buildings are, you know, skyscrapers, right? Almost skyscrapers, whatever. And I remember Wolco. This was now in the 80s, early 80s. So this would be or maybe late 70s, early 80s. So just after Star Trek, the motion picture, Star Trek, Wrath of Khan. I guess really Wrath of Khan. 
sort of around the Wrath of Khan time period, so about 82. Wood, Wolko, or Woodwards, Woodwards. It was, um, you know, the main, the main level was groceries or something like that, produce. And then you go up the es escalator, and then it'd be the next floor. And then you go around in the department store up the next escalator. So I think toys were on the third floor. And it was sort of like, like this exhilarating miracle of a store. <laughs> because when you got, you, you go, up, I think second floor was clothing or something. You know, as a kid, you're not interested in any of that stuff. You just want to go to the toy department. So you get on this escalator and you go up and it'll be like, ugh, clothing. Then you go up one more and be like, ugh, tools. And then you get to the top floor and that was the toys. Yeah, Woodward's, Eaton's, Woolworth, Woolworth's, and the Bay, and Zeller's. Seems like almost every department store we had as a kid in Canada is gone. But um, so anyway, you go up in Wilco's and all of a sudden the escalator, because you can't see what's coming up because all you can see is the, you know, the escalator coming up, right? The, the steps. And then all of a sudden it opens up and here's the toy department. And there's, there's like this distance in between the escalator and you. And then the the displays from the toys. So you'd come up and you'd sort of see, you know, stairs, stairs, stairs. And then all of a sudden you could see the landing. And then as, as you come up further on this escalator staircase, all of a sudden the toys and everything come into view. So it's like this whole, oh, you know, the thing opens up visually. And so anyway, they, they had the toy department. And then up along the wall this side they had all the models and that's where you found like the klingon uh the klingon cruiser from star trek the motion picture sitting there in a box and then the enterprise and the new wrath of Khan stuff that had just come in because of course the amt just reboxed the uh motion picture stuff with the wrath of Khan lettering on it for the second run and i think that's where i, I got my vulcan shuttle and a bunch of the other stuff because I was big in Star Trek in that time. Again, more influences from my dad. <laughs> but yeah, that was always fun going to Woodward's. And then we'd meet my my other grandma downtown, my mom's mom. We used to meet her downtown and then we'd eat lunch at uh, Zeller's, I guess it was. Or maybe again, Woodward's upstairs. That was always fun. And of course, my grandma was a my grandma was a single mom during the whole thirties because my grandpa passed away from a heart attack when he was in his thirties. <laughs> so, yeah, more of that Great Depression looping that back to the whole thirties thing. For my 1930 Packard. But yeah. Yeah, all that fun stuff. Yeah, my grandma lived in a... Not really a, an old folks home. But I guess it was sort of... Um, uh, I don't know, because everything back in the day was different from what we have now, right? <clears throat> so... She didn't live in an old folks' home until the very end. But she almost lived to 100 years old, my mom's mom. She got that letter from the queen. <laughs> you know, when, when uh, the elderly turn 99 or something, or their late 90s, the queen of England in Canada sends out a letter saying, you know, we are so happy that or have a happy birthday from the queen. Of course, it's more official, right? <laughs> Basically, it's like, like uh, we're so happy that you live to 100 years of age. And it's it's a big formal letter. It comes from the Queen of England. 
or the uh, secretary general or whatever else if the queen is not available. So my grandma has one of those. My mom now has a certificate because, of course, she passed away a long time ago. But, um, yeah, that's that's what the Canadian government does. They actually have the queen send you birthday wishes at 100 years of age in this big formal letter with the uh, queen's logo and everything on it. So hopefully I can get one myself <laughs> one day. <laughs> one day quite many days away from this day. But, uh, yeah, so back in the day, my grandma raised raised about seven kids, basically, on her own through the Great Depression. Because my grandpa was uh, fought in World War One, I, I think, and passed away, not in the war, but in the early part of the 30s, he had a heart attack. But yeah, so that's what I know of. Oh, so yeah, anyway, my uh, grandma at the time when I was young, she was living in this, I guess they were seniors' apartments is what you would call them now. So they're apartment buildings where the senior citizens can still get around and they can still cook and they can still clean and, you know, take the bus and all that kind of stuff. And then when they get to a an age where they can't do that anymore, that's when they ended up in the the assisted old folks home. But yeah, that's quite interesting how they they had certain things back then that we now know as like welfare or something. But back in the day they weren't called they, they didn't have a welfare office. They had it. it was named something different, you know. So, yeah, even we had a change too. It's, we used to have EI, employment insurance, and that was if you didn't have a job, but you had been working for somebody, you got EI. And then they renamed it because I guess employment insurance started to get a bad name <laughs> and or maybe they maybe it was welfare got renamed to ei so i don't know i can't remember anymore i'm si self-employed so i i cannot not claim ei <laughs> so if you can't claim ei you don't really go looking for ei and if you're trying to be self-employed you don't really want to be in a bread line <laughs> so anyway <laughs> try to avoid that so yes the millionaire mindset is you look at it and you say what do I need to do to get you know I want to get So you don't say, I can't get that because you have to change your thinking to say, how can I get that? How can I get, like here, number one, how can I get more models into the hobby shop instead of, I can't get more models into the hobby shop? So that's how I try to think, even though sometimes my initial knee-jerk reaction is to think, I can't do it. <laughs> So I have to correct myself in the day to get that that other thinking going there. But I do actually have somebody that I can get their models from, and I've added them to my collection to sell to uh, to sell, you know, for the store. The only issue I have is the I need to get a few more bucks together. <laughs> and I actually was going to get some this month. But then this month, I haven't really been selling anything. So it's sort of that iffy thing. Like, okay, do I get them? Do I, do I get them to have the potential to sell a few more? Or is 
right now when I'm supposed to not buy anything and just sell what I already have to make sure that I can uh, carry on to the next month. So again, it's really a kind of a tough decision because I, you know, you got a 50-50 chance. So if I spend the money that I should be saving for a bill, then uh, am I going to make that money back by the time that bill comes around? Or if I don't spend the money, at least I know I have the bill covered. But then, <laughs> you know, <laughs> am I going to have something to sell to somebody? I don't know. And it's kind of weird, too, because I do have all the stuff to sell to people. It's just those people either don't know I have the stuff to sell it to or they don't want to buy it or something. Like, it's it's not so plain cut and dry. <clears throat> I was saying this to my wife. You know, we do the best. We try everything we can to uh, keep the hobby shop going and everything, but you're still under those same factors. Starting with, first off, how many people have a computer? <laughs> not And um, because I know a few people that will not get a computer because they figure the computer is going to somehow spy on them or whatever else, something silly like that. Eh? Or, you know, the, you've got um, people like my mom who are, she's of that mindset of, you know, I'm too old. I'm too old to learn a computer and I don't care anyway. So you got like people that don't have a computer because they don't want to have a computer. People that can't afford a computer, potentially, you know, or people that just aren't interested in having a computer. So you've, you've sort of got that. And, and how many people is that? What percentage of, of everything I'm trying to do is these people that just do not, will not, and, and whatever the computer, right? So those people are already gone. You can't, you can't include them because they're not there. So then the second part is, how many people, even though they have a computer, are willing to shop online? So there's another percentage of people that are not going to be there. Then, um, then the next thing is how many people have a computer and are using it to shop online? So then the next part is how many people are coming to Monster Hobbies or even know that I'm here? And are and then there's that element. And then. When you get to there, you've got those four things. And then how many people are going to go through the shopping process? And then are they going to be turned off because my thing doesn't, my website doesn't look like the next guy's website, or maybe my prices are a little more than Amazon or some of the cheapy places. So then those people got to go through that experience and either fall off or stay on. So if they stay on, then it's the next thing is, can they use, the PayPal or the credit card system? Or are they going to, you know, do they realize that if they're in town, they can actually meet me and forgo that and, you know, meet me at, see what I've got online, pick it out and then buy it from me, meet at the Tim Hortons over here, you know, or are they going to not realize that they can do that? So they're getting so far and then they're off. So finally, you need the, the person that that finds us, finds the item they want, knows that we're here, works out a way to deal with us for buying the thing, and gets to the last step where they actually do buy it, and I'm shipping it out on Friday. And it's going through this big funnel till you get the little people dropping out at the bottom that that become my, you know, 10th time around customer. Uh, you know, and all that stuff, building that relationship on top of all of this that's going on. So this is this is sort of everything I'm doing. So on the website design aspect of it, I'm not really failing or whatever, because like I just got this, right? I put that online. This is a, a tribute comic magazine thing to Superman. So anything you you want to know about like where's Superman's parents and all that stuff. And um, 
this is all the memoirs and memories. Like there's even stuff printed in here from obviously the, the 1940s era of Superman comics. And uh, there's some from like the seventies, sort of what was going on in the life of Superman and all that stuff. So, and then like alternate world Supermans and some of the little Superman side characters, like the, the girlfriend and super monkey or whatever this guy is and super dog and super boy and super girl and super fish and super shark. And then it gets into like, there's Steve Reeves and then uh, the original Superman live action. Uh, I guess even the Max Flesher stuff is here. And then you got, you know, uh, was it George Reeves or, or uh, I think it's George Reeves. Okay. Yeah. George Reeves. Uh, and, and, and all of that. So I just put this on our website. Wizards Magazine, um, what's that say? Superman Tribute Edition. I got the price. I've got it all keyworded. I've got all the, or the tags, keyword tags, you know, the long tail tags, everything that anybody could use to type in a Google search and find this thing on my website, right? So then it goes down that filter again. I've done everything correctly. This is online. It's got the whole shebang to it. Now, who, who has a computer? Oh, these people don't. <laughs> who's into Superman? Well, maybe these people. Okay, now who's who comes to to the website and it, it looks the way they envision the website that they're going to shop from looks like? Because that's another thing. If they... If somebody is imagining that that I should look like Amazon and I and they get to my page and I don't look like Amazon or eBay and I look like, you know, this is my format, my special monster hobbies format for my website, are they going to mentally accept that or are they going to say, no, this doesn't look like where I want to shop for whatever reason? But then maybe it is. Maybe they say, oh, yeah, this looks great. Or this looks better than where I just was, because that's the other reverse of the coin. So then, you know, is the price right for them? If the price is right for them, now is my shopping cart right for them? Is If my shopping cart is right for them, then, then it goes down and they're the, the person that falls out at the bottom of the filter. So again, it's, it's, I haven't done anything wrong in what I put in there. It's just is there enough people that are into that looking for that, that are going to go through the whole thing and then end up buying that. So I'm shipping it out. And it's all these factors that nobody thinks about. They just figure, Oh, put everything on the internet. It'll be gone by tomorrow. Well, it doesn't work that way. And no matter what type of song dance and everything else I do to try to make it work that way, it's still got to go through this big filter down to the bottom. So not I'm negative or that I'm not trying or all the rest, it's the reality. So like that advertising book I was saying, uh, talking about earlier, they're saying, um, get an ad on the radio. An ad on the radio that says, come and check out our website. <laughs> or get an ad in the bus that has a bus thing so that everybody sitting on the bus can look up when they're looking at their cell phone or whatever they're doing on the bus. And they see the the banner inside the bus, it says, you know, looking for a nice hobby, visit Monster Hobbies online. QR code, take a picture of that QR code with your phone. Boops you right onto the website. You know, there's all these aspects that nobody, they figure print is dead, they figure radio is dead, whatever else, it's all dead. The only thing that exists is the web. Yet you go out there in the real world and there's still, you're sitting on a park bench or bus bench waiting for the bus to come in depending on what town you are, you're in, whatever. Um, I can advertise on the outside of the bus. I've got my advertisement on my car. This sticker is sitting on the spare tire. And my wife works at one of the Wendy's, which is a fast food place. And I've had people phone me up saying, oh, I saw your vehicle sitting in Wendy's. So all these old world advertising techniques are still used. Look, look at Walmart. You get your newspaper delivered to your house. You open it up. There's a Walmart flyer in there. Okay, maybe you don't get the newspaper. So you turn on your internet. All of a sudden, a Walmart ad pops up in a banner. 
or uh, and then you go on YouTube, and then what's there? A Walmart ad. Oh, come shop Walmart for the holidays. Um, what else? Walmart has their big trucks driving around with Walmart on the side of the truck. Walmart building has Walmart as a sign, the name. Um, you turn your radio on, all of a sudden there's a Walmart ad. Uh, what else? Well, you flip through the six channels, and Walmart's on every one of the six channels on your radio. All throughout the whole world, you know? Um you sit on a park bench. It's a Walmart park bench with Walmart written on it. Um, I don't know. And then that, then it becomes word of mouth as well. So you're sitting there and somebody says, uh, check out this pocket knife I got for scouts, right? I just got this scout pocket knife. Where'd you get that? Walmart. You go on Facebook and people are saying, look, there's models in the Walmart display end of the thing. Okay, so that's that's good. Now all of a sudden Walmart has this filter and instead of this little pinprick of a spout at the bottom where people are popping up through, it's like a, a drainage pipe in your sewer where everyone's coming out in massive droves out the bottom because everybody knows Walmart. The Walmartians know Walmart. They beam in there every night. <laughs> anyway, but and so we want to replace the word Walmart with monster hobbies, and we want people to fall through this manhole size cover of the bottom of the filter pipe for monster hobbies. Now, what's the journey and the destination to get there, other than having a ton of money to throw into advertisers' pockets? Well, you just got to take it steps, pinprick, and then you work your way out to the bigger universe, the big spiral. So that could be as simple as me printing off a flyer saying, check out Monster Hobbies, we're still around. Now I can put that paper flyer at, there's a couple of billboards around town, and I can put one in the bottle depot because I know the guy that works there. And that's the base of all this stuff starting off. The newspaper, you can put in your business card ad for $25 an issue, four issues in a month. And it goes on and on from there. I just need to uh, have a little on hand to get it working. But in the meantime, I still have all this stuff to put on the website. So I think I deviated off of building the model. <laughs> I don't know. I guess it kind of goes hand in hand in a weird way. So there's the rear axle for this kit. Getting back to it. Oh, we're coming up that two hours. I guess I'm just getting tired doing the scouting adventure yesterday. Here, I'll just leave that on there. Scouting adventure, the adventure, the building the website up adventure for April adventure. Uh, birthdays. Everybody's having their birthday this month. We've got a full out Capricorn onslaught. <laughs> There's only two, three people. Well, okay, I'll say, I'll essentially say maybe three, maybe four people in our family that do not have a birthday in January. And the other 50 or 60 do. <laughs> this guy like me gets tired of uh, trying to figure out these birthday activities <laughs> when everybody's coming. Coming at you with this going down the, the big pipeline. <laughs> oh, boy. Anyway. Plus, I'm hungry. I missed lunch, which I will not after this is over. So I think for now, we can uh, kind of end our model kit build party. We've got seven of you in here with three likes. It's always nice. Oh, uh, one other thing that's positive, positive energy, tired energy. So I've been looking at our watch time hours for YouTube. So as you may or may not know, uh, you need 1,000 subscribers and 4,000 watch time hours to get monetized on YouTube. So the Monster Hobbies model car garage is very, very close to being monetized. 
I've got 1,081 subscribers. As soon as I hit that 1,000, it just started to ramp up, like not like straight vertical, but, you know, over the last couple of, uh, since I got to the 1,000, maybe two months, it's been going up almost up to 1,100 now. So what I want to do is I've, when I had the 1,000 subscribers, I had a special unboxing video, and that was the 1911 uh, Renault Taxi. So I've got another bunch of model kits. And when we hit 4,000 uh, watch time hours, when I get monetized, I want to have a video where I'm unboxing the model car that didn't get unboxed. So that was the, um, the Lotus, the 1953 Lotus, same car as in The Prisoner, the, the TV show from England. And um, when we hit the 4,000, I want to unbox that in a special video. And currently, last time I checked, I was at 3,900 and something. So I'm close to 3,800 people. So all I'm asking is everybody just watch all my videos a lot. <laughs> Even if you're not there, just let them run in a loop on your computer. Watch a playlist. Watch my playlists. And, um, and help me get those hours up so that I can get this channel monetized. Because that's another part of of this whole, how am I going to restock the store um, is through people watching YouTube videos and YouTube paying me the, uh, the monetization. So if YouTube can pay me the monetization, I can take that money. I've already got it in a bank account that uh, is not connected with automated payments like my store one is. So that means nobody's able to, uh, nobody outside of myself is able to take that that money from YouTube out of that account. So I let that thing build up. And if that can build up enough, I can restock using YouTube money from people just watching videos. You don't have to be um, like monetizing me. Like um, on one of my channels, I do have a thing where you can join and you can join for three bucks a month. And then I've got Patreon where you can join for a dollar on Patreon. And if I can get people on Patreon and YouTube to join, then there's that way, plus the YouTube money from just being watched. And I have one channel monetized right now, but the model, model car one is the second one. If I can get two YouTube channels monetized, then I can work on the third one, which is the official Monster Hobbies YouTube channel, which is where I sell the stuff on or whatever. So if I can get those three monetized, then I can have all this as passive extra income coming in to restock those shelves. And that's what I want to do. So with your help, everybody, we can make that happen. And I guess that's pretty much it. So my name is Trevor Slescu, owner of Monster Hobbies Online. I need a new shirt. Just rip this off. Start again. Anyway, uh, you can find us at www.monster-hobbies.ca or phone the store up into Canada, 403-652-5019 if you're local or whatever. Our website is priced in Canadian dollars. We can ship all the way around the world. I've done it many times before. I had the maps here. They're too far away to reach. Ship all around the world. And um, what else? We offer free shipping on Canadian orders over $75. We accept PayPal and credit cards on our secure pay system, which means when you use our terminal on our website, at the end of that, all your information is erased forever and nobody can access it. And here, I'm just going to type this in the uh, thing here. That's our website. And if you type in purchase wrong. <laughs> if you type in the promo code YouTube, you can save 10% off your next purchase with Monster Hobbies. Oh, and that secure pay thing. So um, because it erases your information, that means that if you order, on, if you ordered something uh, from me on Monday, and then that went through, and then on Wednesday, you wanted to order something else, you have to do your whole credit card thing a second time. 
because it's been erased from the Monday one when it got processed. So that's how our secure pay thing works. Every single time you use a credit card, you got to put your information in again because it'll be gone forever. And if you shop with PayPal, of course, they have their own PayPal thing that does the same thing anyway. In fact, all, all you do on PayPal is you enter in your, you got to hook your PayPal up to your bank and you got to hook in your email address to the PayPal. It's been so long since I did it. But anyway, so it's almost like a e-transfer through PayPal. So you would type in the money and then, uh, oh, hi, Frizzo. I hate to tell you this, but I'm about to wrap up. <laughs> anyway, you put in your email address and what the amount of money is and you send a money request and then it goes through there. And then I guess PayPal has their own security set up. So nobody ever knows your information out of PayPal either. So everything's secure. Don't worry. <laughs> I just box this stuff up and send it. You know, what I need is um, for those people that I've sent items to, I think I need. I, it would be nice if we did some testimonial thing where uh, you videotaped what I sent you and you open it up on your ch YouTube channel. Yeah, thanks, Rizzo. It's, uh, I like that I get some support out here. <laughs> Sometimes it just feels like I'm just talking to the mic for two hours. <laughs> anyway, yeah, um, whoever, I guess whoever I can, uh, wants to shop with me next, I'll just send you an email saying, could you please, or would you mind, or would you be interested? When the package arrives, videotape opening it up so that people can see that I'm, uh, you know, how I package packages and how I make sure your models aren't getting crunched when I, they get shipped and all the rest of that stuff. Oh, and when I do ship stuff, everything gets a tracking number through Canada Post, which I send to you in an email so that uh, you and I can track and see where this thing is going. If you live in Toronto, did it get there? <laughs> all that stuff. Who do I have to get mad at at Canada Post to get this thing figured out if there's a problem? But yeah, anyway. Oh, and there's somebody that needs to be in the timeout box right there. So put user in timeout. Is it working? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, another uh, Cyrillic use person that uh, wants some weird website there. So I'm getting rid of that. Anyway, okay, so where are we here? Oh, we're two hours in, so I'm getting starving. My voice is running out. So I will say goodbye. I am on Wednesday. We'll do another one of the uh, what do I have on my shelves up here videos showing off my collection of model cars, which is starting to run out. <laughs> I only built like 400 of these things. You know, uh, doing this every Wednesday, I'm going to bound, be bound to run out sometime soon. <laughs> anyway. So don't forget to like, subscribe, and share. Thanks for everybody for showing up and supporting and discussing some stuff to discuss. And uh, until next time, we will see you later. Okay, let's just click this and have a good one.